Minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resonant Lecture Series version 5. Slides up by Dr. Maloney. I'm Sakip Rahman narrating. And in the first video, we talked about uh, just definitions and what do we mean by minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis and how we've this somewhat represents an evolution uh, in uh, plating techniques, um, but are still in line with the original AO principles. Um, we're going to pick up now talking a little bit more about uh, some specific injuries that are very suitable for mupo plating. Uh, distal femur, we kind of touched on a little bit. So a couple of anatomic concerns. The superficial femoral artery averages 21 millimeters from the screw tips placed through a lateral plate, but can be as close as 8 millimeters. And if you use the LIS plating uh, system, which is a proprietary system, um, just it's been studied, just keep in mind you know, the holes six through 10 are at the highest risk. So this is just something specific to that particular plate system, but just be cautious about plunging drill bits and screws that are too long, okay? On the medial side of the femur. So minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis of the distal femur can result in satisfactory coronal and sagittal plane alignment most of the time, um, but there's a high risk of rotational malreduction, right up to 50%. Uh, as in the, reported in the uh, reference below, and also potential for limb length inequality. And we'll go through why some of these things can occur, but a lot of it is somewhat to do with the fact that you know you're minimally invasive, you're not seeing everything. You have to be very very cautious about um, your overall alignment and reduction. And if you're using bumps and things like that, uh, bumping up the hip, for example, um, you can get a little bit lost with what your rotation should be at also has to do with plate placement. So think about, and this is something we all know, but when you're in there and fixing it, you often don't, uh, you just don't really uh, automatically consider unless you're, you're really you know, trained to, to think about this and uh, are constantly you know, looking at the distal femur as being trapezoidal in real time, right? So you know, what happens is that, uh, so when viewed on uh, end, the distal femur is a trapezoid. So if you put the plate too posterior or distal, what will happen is you will shift the femur over medially, right? So, um, for instance, if the you know the plate is supposed to be on the shaft here and um, it's designed to sort of sit anteriorly, but instead you place it posteriorly, well, what's happened? You've now brought the plate this far over. Right, so what's going to happen when you put cortex screws here? Well, it's going to pull, it's going to pull that shaft this distance over, right? So as it does that, you're going to get essentially a relative, you know, medialization of the distal segment or so-called golf club deformity. So that is something you got to be really cautious of. Another thing you got to be careful with is that, you know, when you're placing screws here. So let's say you're placing screws from here to here. Well, if that screw is here, that's that's potentially sticking out. And you, you may not recognize that because you're looking at, and this is what I see all the time, you're looking at the femur as being that wide. And on your perfect AP x-ray, you're just you're you're not recognizing that screw sticking out. As a matter of fact, if the if the femur is a little bit externally rotated when you get your picture, you're gonna you're gonna eat, overestimate or you're you're gonna underestimate how much the screw is sticking out even more. So it's really important. Sometimes you got to get oblique x-rays and recognize where your screws are also in relation to the distal uh, femur cortex because medially those distal locking screws, any screws here, if you're doing a retrograde nail and having those screws coming out here in a very, very distal area, right down here, those screws can be very, very symptomatic. Okay, Up here, not as much, but down here, you got to really be careful. You really know how long those screws are by getting oblique images. Okay, so uh, in the proximal tibia, um, this is a nice opportunity for minimally invasive plating. Also, you can slide the plate in a submuscular fashion along the anterolateral tibia and do distal fixation percutaneously. Um, so here you see an example of uh, proximal tibia, um, limited incision, clamp-assisted uh, uh, and plate-assisted uh, reduction. You can see um, there's a lag screw here. There's a plate along the lateral cortex. And then you can see fixed with a periarticular plate. And they used uh, 
a technique in which distal screws are placed percutaneously, right? Now you are going through the anterior uh, compartment when you do that, and we'll talk about uh, what you got to be careful of uh, with that. Um, so we mentioned this already in the last video. Um, it's a proprietary system. It's worth bringing up because it's very early MEPO system that allowed percutaneous plate insertion and also percutaneous self-drilling, self-tapping, locking screws. Uh, and the thought was you designed, you essentially constructed this internal external fixator where everything was kind of locked to the plate um, and uh, you know works very well for certain type of fracture patterns. So here it is uh, for utilized for an open fracture that had some proximal extension um, that um, certainly you could treat with an intramedullary nail. Uh, they chose to do a less invasive um, um, plating technique by using the list system here. And you can see if you look very closely, this has sort of these unicortical self-drilling self-tapping locking screws that are placed through an aiming arm. So, so there are some technical issues. Uh, it's been around for a while, so a lot's been written about it. Um, there can be some difficulty removing screws because you can get cold welding. Uh, so if you ever have to go back and take these out, be mindful of that. It's reported in almost 40% of cases. Uh, other things, especially in the proximal tibia, just it's, you know, in the, in the lateral thigh, when you place the plate uh, for a distal femur, let's say uh, submuscular under the vastus, um, there are no major named nerves um, in the trajectory where you will be placing your aiming arm and going. I mean, you're certainly puncturing through fascia and muscle and down to the plate. But in the proximal tibia, you're going through the uh, anterior compartment. Um, and if when you get a little bit further distal uh, in the lower leg, we all know the superficial perineal nerve has somewhat of a variable course and the lateral and anterolateral part of the leg. Uh, so this has been studied and superficial perineal nerve is at risk um, with percutaneous screw placement and sort of that you know, mid to distal part. So in the cadavers they looked at, it was holes 11 through 13. Uh, which is about 26 to 30 centimeters from the proximal end of the plate. Um, so just keep in mind, uh, proximally you may be fine as you get a little bit further down. If you're just shooting through the aiming arm, uh, just remember the, the superficial perineal nerve could be right in the trajectory. So you may need to consider a more of a sort of open approach and dissecting down if you're putting screws in at that level. Um, so there is a video if you want to head over to otaonline.org and check out. There's a video on minimally invasive plate uh, osteosynthesis of the proximal tibia. You can check that out. What about the distal tibia? So distal tibia uh, fixation um, can be performed with MEPO techniques. Uh, here's a couple of examples here uh, where you can see there are... Um, so yeah, you can see both on the top and bottom example where the uh, screws are being placed th uh, through very limited incisions. And obviously there's indirect reduction techniques being used, bumps, traction, possibly distractor uh, to get your reduction percutaneous clamps. Uh, and uh, typically for minimally invasive plating in the distal tibia, the plate is typically done uh, medially as opposed to like anteriorly or anterolaterally that are done with some of the open techniques. So uh, there is, you know, as we know in the distal tibia, a risk of wound infection. Uh, it's a primary concern given the limited soft tissue envelope over the medial ankle. So um, sometimes this may lead to the need for plate removal, debridement, and flap coverage. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, not necessarily uh, something that's worse with an open versus MEPO plating uh, per se, but um, regardless, this is an area where, you know, if you could treat with a, with a nail, it doesn't, just because we have minimally invasive plating doesn't mean it's more biologically friendly than a nail. I mean, so with a nail, um, you're not disrupting very much of the periosteum at all. And truly this is a more minimally invasive technique if you think about, you know, preservation of the blood supply. So, um, and of course, that's another lecture, but, you know, nailing techniques have, and nailing 
uh, devices have allowed us to uh, treat more and more proximal and distal fractures. So MEPO is an option, but it doesn't mean we forget about our other options. What about the humerus? So there are multiple approaches that have been described. It is a little bit technically demanding due to the anatomic concerns, but some groups have definitely showed success with this uh, plating method. Uh, keep in mind that percutaneous screw placement is somewhat unsafe over the majority of the length of the humerus, uh, but there are a few places you, you can do this. So there are two limited incisions, one um, proximally uh, between the deltoid and uh, biceps, um, and uh, the brachialis split distally. Um, to avoid injury to the radial nerve, and then the plate can be slid in a submuscular fashion as shown here. Um, so this is one way, and, and again, the major uh, uh, potential for injury is the, the, the radial nerve, but of course if you go medially, there are um, brachial artery and uh, median and ulnar nerve potential as well, but most of what we worry about when going anterior and interlateral in the humerus is going to be the radial nerve. But uh, this is a technique that has shown uh, some success. Um, and this particular study is a randomized controlled trial comparing conventional plating to MEPO with equivalent uh, union and complication rates. Of course, increased floor time with MEPO, uh, but uh, these were done by experienced uh, orthopedic trauma surgeons who are comfortable doing this technique. So those are the two incisions we talked about. Uh, as a percentage of humeral length measured from the lateral of a condyle, the nerves most at risk during the anterior approach when you're doing this method um, are the musculocutaneous nerve approximately, 18 to 42%, and then uh, you know, mid to distal is going to be a radial nerve, 36 to 60%. Um, and you do have to be careful with your screw placement, right? So uh, you know, proximally or distally, you know, A to P screws can potentially injure the radial nerve. So, um, again, two incisions proximally between the biceps and deltoid, distally elevate the brachialis from the intermuscular septum. Um, in this particular study, no percutaneous screws were placed. Um, so you're looking at it, but you're not open. I mean, you're looking at where you're placing your screws, but you're not opening up the entire arm. Uh, and uh, these are where they found the structures most at risk. And uh, if you think about it, these danger zones span nearly the entire humerus. So what about the proximal humerus? Um, well, um, this has been done as well. Described technique includes a limited anterolateral, acromial sort of, you know, anterolateral approach, deltoid split, um, 2.5 centimeters distal to the acromion. So you have to recognize where the uh, axillary nerve here, which is right about here. Um, so the axillary nerve does cross at the level of where you often are going to be putting in calcar screws, that is the screws that are sort of uh, in the inferior uh, part of the surgical neck uh, that are often needed for successful ORIF. So you do have to be cautious uh, and some plates will be designed differently so that it may not necessarily be right at that location, but it is often where you're going to end up. What about MEPO humerus through a posterior approach? Uh, there's a video if you want to head over to otaonline.org. It's done through uh, two limited incisions, uh, one between the long and lateral head of the triceps proximally, and then radial to the triceps tendon distally, and the plate is slid under the radial nerve. Uh, not a very commonly done approach, uh, but um, there is a video where you can take a look at this technique. Of course, a lot of surgeons uh, really want to see the radial nerve if you're going to be operating under it or putting a plate under it. Uh, what about clavicle? Well, while MEPO clavicle can result in shorter operative times and shorter uh, incisions, um, you know, times of union is related to fracture reduction. So it's sometimes in the in the clavicle can be a little bit difficult to obtain uh, via MEPO. Uh, here's a randomized control trial. Um, in orthopedics if you want to take a look at that. What about the distal radius? Well, a dorsal spanning plate is off is essentially a MEPO technique, right? So this is something that's done uh, sometimes in lieu of external fixation. Uh, so you can see uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Ilyas in the reference below uh, discussing uh, this technique, which 
compares favorably to external fixation of geriatric distal radius fractures with regard to patient outcome complex regional pain syndrome and infection, and essentially is a MEPO method. So here you can see a plate that's essentially designed for this. Uh, limited incision is localized fluoroscopically, centered between the second and third metacarpal. Uh, you bridge across the dorsal aspect of the distal radius, get deep exposure between the second and third compartments. Superficial radial nerve will be at some risk, and then you slide the plate under the extensor retinac uh, retinaculum, uh, which is itself not exposed. So you'll have something like this. You can usually use the second metacarpal or possibly the third, um, and your AP and lateral images will, will look something like this. So something that you might otherwise achieve with external fixation, let's say if you have Severely comminuted injury, uh, radiocarpal dislocation, etc. And we're not going to go through the indications, but this is something that can be done uh, essentially as a MEPO method um, and as a temporary plate, plate removal at three months uh, if bony union and patient is physiologically appropriate and desires removal. So usually it is removed. So we went through a lot of different uh, techniques and hopefully you understand the basic principles. I mean, MEPO, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis, allows insertion of plates with minimal disruption of the soft tissues. It can be done safely with appropriate awareness of anatomy. Uh, and MEPO is described for a wide variety of fractures. I mean, we focused a lot on the distal femur and proximal tibia, but distal radius is another example, um, and to some extent in the humerus. So while there is literature to describe MEPO and things in areas like the humerus, anatomic concerns may, uh, for many, mean that the risks outweigh the potential benefits. Here are the references. Thank you very much.